You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is captivating story this is um lucy i love the book so much it is such a unique take on this time period and these uh horrific world events that that uh that are uh you know so top of mind for uh for the reading community these days you know we're getting more and more stories about this time period and these people and and i i love the unique take that that you bring to us in this book welcome to the show well, thank you very much, Hank, and thank you so much for such a positive introduction. You are so welcome. Uh, Lucy, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? <laughs> oh, what a lovely question. Um, I have always written since I could pick up a pencil and I wrote when I was in what we in England called infant school. So as soon as I could could write, I was I was quite well known in school for just being away in my own world scribbling. And I wrote nonfiction and I wrote stories and I've just been writing compulsively ever since. So I think the first bit, the first stories I wrote were probably fairy stories. But I do know that the head teacher at the school, he read out a story of mine in assembly. You know, that's the school gathering. And it featured it heavily featured clothes and the clothes that the characters were wearing. So, well, that's really stayed with me over the last few years. <laughs> what what do you attribute this love of uh, fashion? Um, you know that that clothes mean so much. Uh, you know uh, to to bring out the character of characters, uh, so to speak. Yeah, I I mean I've got to tell you I'm not really a fashion follower, but I'm really interested in the stories that clothes tell. And that probably goes back a lot to books as well, that I used to load up with books at our local library. And amongst these would be histories of costume or any really history books, you know, with pictures that children have. And so I was just struck by how very different people looked. But of course, we're all human beings underneath it all. So now as a clothes historian, I just found it so interesting how much information clothes give us about our lives, our personalities, our cultures, our technology. What do you think um, clothes tell us about, um, like if, if we're just discovering a, a time period in particular, maybe that uh, we're looking into events that happened during a particular time and, and we're not that familiar with it, maybe we know the the bullet points of an, an historical event that, that we've learned in school or or something. What what do you think it is that that clothes can tell us? A lot of it are things that are very familiar to us. You might see a picture of someone from the 17th century or the 19th century and think, oh, my goodness, that is so different. We do not dress like that. But when we really get down to it, people dress for status. So they show, you know, who's got money, who hasn't, who has power, who doesn't. They show a lot about sex or presentation of gender. So there's a lot of cultural divides there. And they show a lot about your individual flair. You know, who's managed to sneak in a very jaunty tie with a somber suit or who's going against fashion or who's following fashion. So those things, I think, they connect us to the past and remind us that we're really, you know, we're human beings underneath all those clothes. But there are lots of clues you can look for. And I think best of all, uh, from a history point of view, they tell us about technology and travel because you can analyze people's clothes and think, well, where did the silk come from there? Were they from Eastern European mulberry bushes? Oh, there must have been a trade route. Or you look at it and think, wow, that's nylon. That must be that's, you know, that's a relatively modern creation. And really, clothes enable us to do so much and they link so much with human exploration whether it's into Antarctica or up into orbit. So it's it's limitless, really, the, the interest you can have. Do you think that our modern technology that has uh, 
infused so much into um, fashion or or and and I I'm, I'm not using the word fashion properly um, into the the types of clothes that that we wear um, because things have become so industrialized and so manufactured. Um, do, do you think that we we lose um, some of the historicity that that people might you know maybe 50 100 years from now will look back on the the time period that we're in now and not be able to learn as much about us as we can people 100 years prior to us does that question even make sense 100 years from now they are going to be able to to read everything they were and they will be able to analyze our, our obsession with fast fashion or growing interest in sustainable clothes or they'll be able to analyze production values or the growth of new boutiques and smaller artisans so no all the clues will still be there i mean it's really interesting to look at clothes now and think how they suit our lifestyles a lot more but for me, I, I tend not to think about modern clothes. I'm very much about looking back. I'm, uh, I, I think anything 20th century is modern, really. Gotcha. So where did your love of, of studying clothing uh, and your love of storytelling, where, where did those two intersect? I think like a lot of people in life, you come to things gradually. And so my love of stories and storytelling and my love of history really combined when I was a postgraduate and I was able to explore literature, history and archaeology together, actually. And the archaeology taught me that objects are just so fascinating. And in particular, when you're looking at the lives of people who wouldn't ordinarily have monuments or documentary evidence, you're looking at objects to tell stories and you're almost trying to discover people who've disappeared in history. And that's especially true for women, women's history. And so really in my 20s and 30s, I was very much focusing on how do we find out about domestic lives and things, stories that haven't been told in history. And I was able to specialise more and more and start building my collection of antique and vintage clothing. And so that's been fascinating to reach the point where I'm at now, where I can bring in all sorts of areas of interest and, and use the clothes to focus that. The um, the new book is a is a work of of history. It's it's not historical fiction like we see so much um, in, uh, in in and stories that are coming out about this time period. Um, the, but you are not just um, an historical writer. You have written other things as well, other um, fictional works. Uh, how did you get started doing that? I've always written fiction. I've always written stories. And the first thing I submitted to an agent that was accepted was a young adult story that was actually riffing really on Holocaust history because I'd long been interested in the Holocaust and how stories and fragments and little glimpses of people, how we hold on to those. And since then, my fiction career went really well. And then I came across while researching for a history book about um, the 1940s, I came across mention of a fashion salon in Auschwitz. And at the time, I wasn't able to find out a great deal more about it. There was just a list of a few first names, really. And so I, I wrote a young adult novel imagining what it would be like to be in that sort of situation. And it was called The Red Ribbon, and it was published in, in many different countries. And actually, it was the fiction that led me to writing history because people heard about the Red Ribbon, they saw articles, heard interviews, and they got in touch with me. And they emailed to say, well, actually, I know who those names are. And I was able to connect with the children, second and third generations of survivors, and ultimately to track down the last surviving seamstress of this fashion salon in Auschwitz. So if I hadn't crafted a story, I do appreciate that Holocaust fiction, it, it's not without its issues. But if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have been able to write the the very in-depth history that I've been working on for the last few years. So that's quite quite a connection, really. Sure. Um, other than the the obvious uh, difference that's, you know, right on the surface, um, when you're writing a, a, a true history versus historical fiction, um, 
of course, they, they both are rooted in facts and, uh, you know, historical fiction might veer off in in some of the the details that are then made up by the author to bridge historical events. Um, and, and, and if I'm describing that properly, uh, but as a as a writer who has done both, how do you approach um each one of those projects differently when when you sit down to write historical fiction um do you is, is the the research different than than writing a true history and and how do you like where do those projects start diverging that's a really interesting topic yes i think always you do your research i mean people who write historical fiction they're well known for chasing down the most obscure details and sure. I think now, now I've done the history book about the dressmakers of Auschwitz, I couldn't write the fiction. I couldn't take what's true and turn it into a story. So I think with fiction, historical fiction, you write what's feasible. So you imagine what could happen within the parameters. And sometimes I've introduced paranormal into my historical fiction, or I've introduced, you know, some element that, that clearly is not true. And it maybe isn't feasible from from a strictly practical point of view, but you can play a bit more as long as your reader inhabits the world. And as long as you decide as an author where you are on the spectrum of authenticity, I think as, as long as you, you make it very clear, you know, this is either all true or this is a, a wonderful fantasy historical story. But if you're writing a, a history book and particularly if you're writing something like Holocaust history, then the integrity is absolutely core. I did not make up a single phrase or or piece of dialogue in the dressmakers of Auschwitz book. I only used the sources that I could get. And yes, I've interpreted, I put my own interpretation on some of the sources, but I have made it very clear when that's happening. And so any interactions, any scenes that are in there, they are not imagined. They come from testimonies. And I, I think that's the difference. You can't let your imagination run away with you. But saying that, a history writer also has to have a narrative. And sure. there has to be, there, are, there is an element, isn't there, of crafting a story and drawing a reader in, even if it's all true. Well, that was going to be the next question that I asked you is that um, when you're writing history or if you're writing memoir or, or something – um, uh, or, or even a, a biography, um, you know, unless you're telling a story cradle to grave, um, there is there is a narrative thread that goes through there. And I, I like to to look at it like uh, we're looking at an event through a window of time. Um, when when you're telling a story like this, how did you define the window that you're going to give us a glimpse into, um, uh, you know, how did, where did you find that narrative thread and, and, and how did you start to define what, you know, what the, the, the scope of the journey that you're going to take us readers on? Mm. Yes, you definitely need a path, don't you, through the, I mean, there's a huge amount of, of possibilities of places that the story can take you, particularly in, in this case, we're dealing with a lot of different women from different places. And there are so many areas that you want to go off. Oh, I could tell the readers about this. Oh, I must tell them about that. But you, you need a map for a readers to follow. You need a path. And so I chose to settle on a core of the women who worked in the dressmaking salon, and they were the ones that I had the most information about. And it is mainly chronological. And it was intended to introduce the reader to the different characters, if I can call real people that. And then you see how their lives converge, you know, from when they're, from when they're young children and they have no idea that their lives are going to be impacted by meeting in this particular time and place in the future. And then I also gave it quite a lot of context, and that's where the historical background came in, to see what forces are working on these characters to bring them all on their different journeys to this particular time and place in hell. It took quite a lot of structuring, actually. It, so much information and, and wanting to, to get it right, but also to make it readable and to to give it the impact that it deserves, really, the, the power of these, these narratives. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. 
PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. What Death Taught Tarrant by Derek McFadden. Life is a journey. So is the afterlife. At the end of his life, Terrence McDonald must discover its meaning or he'll be banned from the afterlife forever and his soul will cease to exist. Join Terrence and those who love him on a poignant and unforgettable journey through a life at once wonderful and harrowing. Learn what Terrence learned. See what Terrence sees. By this provocative story's end, readers may even learn a thing or two about themselves. See why people are saying things like, Derek McFadden writes with an insight you can match. If you like the works of Mitch Album, I think you'll find What Death Taught Terrence a worthy addition to your library and the reading of it, a life-affirming journey. I found the story immediately immersive and it stuck with me long after I finished. What Death Taught Terrence by Derek McFadden on sale now. Lucy, I would imagine that a lot of um, historical fiction winds up being historical fiction because we don't have the full picture of or we don't have it, it, enough sources to tell a complete story. Therefore, the author, you know, takes some liberties to to fill in some holes and, and uh, you know, and, and we we realize the story is what it is for for that reason. Um, but. With the dressmakers of Auschwitz, you you talked about having all of these sources and and having um, you know enough information that you had to sift through it to to find the the narrative thread that that you you know of the story that you wanted to tell. When did you realize that there was enough information that you could tell um, you know a a, a true. Uh, a, a true historical narrative. What, when did you realize that there was enough that that you didn't have to step in and and wear your storyteller hat to fill in holes? That that there there were there was enough information that that there weren't any holes like that. Sure, well, it's something I've been researching for twenty years. I've been looking into this idea of linking the textile industry and the Holocaust. So so that subject was there. Having the personal details came later. It came only a few years ago. And it was as my source is one source leads to another that I was then able to think, right, not only have I got all of this really strong historical context, we've got these very human stories. But I think in some ways, I, I think your question there does a bit of a disservice to historical fiction, as if historical fiction is only fiction because we don't know enough facts. I think sure. fiction serves a wonderful purpose for for authors to use their creativity and imagination in that sense. So I'm not 
I'm not going to set one against the other at all. They both of, have. Of course not. Yeah. Yeah. Both have a role. But I, I think it was as the emails started coming in from the relatives of survivors and as I started watching the, the show of video testimonies of survivors and then, of course, meeting the last surviving seamstress, that is a story in itself, isn't it? I flew from England where I live. I flew to, to San Francisco and it was a very, very personal it was a literal journey, but a really personal, emotional impact to essentially to fly halfway around the world and meet a stranger. So in itself, that was a story. And that's how I decided to frame the history of the dressmakers is arriving at the house of this this um, survivor, Mrs. Kohut, and then of leaving her. And in between, we see how she came to be in Auschwitz, but also how she survived and how she lives now chronological i suppose really isn't it the it's right. one of the the oldest storytelling paths <laughs> of all i love it the dressmakers of auschwitz uh the subtitle is the true story of the women who sewed to survive what a provocative um subtitle for the book because it it, it immediately um brings about all sorts of imaginations of, of people uh, of of women who are um have found a, a place to be useful to the enemy um, so that they can um, so that they can live and in even doing things that that um, that they're not happy to be doing. Um, it's it's a story of survival. Um, tell us a, 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 for people who don't know and are not familiar with the story, who were these women and and what was this job they were given? It's one of the most grotesque anomalies that I've ever come across. And I think that title, you know, Sewing to Survive, and you think, really? Because sewing is well, it's often associated with women or domestic work. You know, it's something that maybe your mother, your grandmother is working on, or it's something that maybe happens in a, in a sweatshop or a factory. And we think of it as quite ephemeral, really. Oh, it's just clothes. It's just needle and thread. But the idea that your life could depend on that, I think... Well, that, as you say, that subtitle really, really is very startling and, and provocative. So essentially, um, it's looking at how predominantly Jewish prisoners in Auschwitz were selected by the camp commandant's wife. She, as an SS officer's wife, wanted very beautiful elite clothes and not content with stealing them from the plunder warehouses in the concentration camp. She selected prisoners to come and sew for her in a dedicated salon in in the main camp of Auschwitz. So in terms of writing, you couldn't make it up. You couldn't think of something that would just be so grotesque that people who essentially have been told you are not human beings, you don't have names, you are just numbers, you are subhuman. And then to save their, to, well, hopefully to prolong their lives because conditions were still hard for them, they have to make beautiful clothes with sensual fabrics and embellishments. And yet it's also meaningful work. So it reminds them that they're human. And best of all, the sewing salon becomes a hub of resistance and a haven. And the woman who ran the salon, the prisoner who ran it, named Marta Fuchs, she used it as a haven to save lives. So that needle and thread and fabric and everything that seems frivolous is absolutely essential to their survival. What a strange combination and a very powerful imagery in my mind of, of women sewing, you know, needles in, needles out. And you have an SS guard in the salon who's striding up and down, making making comments. And then you have the SS wives arriving for their fittings. So it absolutely has the makings of a great story. And then what's even more staggering is it's all true. That that is that that's what kept just um setting me aback. Just look, the, oh my God, this 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 is true. This actually happened. You know, you, you can kind of conjure up these um these images of what's going on and the the surreal nature uh it is yeah. just more than than you can comprehend sometimes. It's it's crazy. It's just absolutely it, crazy. It is. And that is the appropriate response. Right. I mean, of course, the genocide is crazy. And I think this fashion salon highlights 
the greed, the hypocrisy, the privilege of the of the SS, of the Germans running the camp, and the fact that they're still using enslaved labor. And then on a very human note, forget what the SS are doing, focusing on the dressmakers themselves, they manage to retain their humanity. They carry out lots of acts of quiet heroism, little acts of kindness that defy all the monolithic genocidal activities of the SS, all of that brutality and degradation. So I suppose as, as a book, as a narrative, it's also dealing with really fundamental themes, isn't it? What, what does it mean to be a villain or to be a hero? And that you can be a hero with needles and thread and sharing your last bit of bread and you can be a villain just walking into a salon and not treating the workers as human beings. Lucy, more than just finding um, dry uh, historical information about these people in this time uh, that went on, you got to have one-on-one -on -one personal conversations. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, finding uh, – you know, actual um, survivors uh, of of this mm. time and this place, as opposed to and 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 you know those things are are not th those people will not be available for for much longer. Um, you know, we're we're rapidly losing um, this generation uh, of people mm. who who personally harbor these stories. Um, what was it like to get to get um, the story straight from the witnesses' mouths? Mm. I think it's always too late to get stories in some sense. You know, perhaps we all reach an age and a maturity where we think, oh, I wish I'd asked my parents or my grandparents that. So it's always too late in a way. And and there was only one surviving dressmaker. Um, and she, when I met her, was 98 years old. And I suppose really, although I don't think of history as being dry facts because I love it and I love the sure. research. It, it is a question of converting that intellectual response, maybe what you read in books, what you see in documents, and then you're hit a very, very powerful impact with, oh, this is not just history. This is people's lives. This is lived experience. And I think that's that's an incredible, powerful thing for a writer to balance an objective and subjective approach. Actually, meeting Mrs. Cohut blew away all my. I suppose I had I had a lot of questions prepared. There were things I wanted to know, and what was really interesting is learning to sit back and listen to what Mrs. Cohut wanted to tell me. And sometimes I think that's the same with story writing or narrative writing. You think you've got the plan. You think you've got it all laid out. And actually, as you start writing, you listen to what the material or the story or the characters are telling you. So it was very much a question of listening and seeing what she was telling me and what she wasn't telling me, too. I had to look for a lot of gaps and things that were compartmentalized that she did not want to or was not able to talk about. So sometimes with a story, you look for what's not there. And that can be really powerful, too. Absolutely. Um, Lucy, you have written all sorts of books and, and have uh, a, a a fantastic back catalog um, looking over the stories that you have told. And now um, with the new book, uh, with the Dressmakers of Auschwitz, um, how do you start looking for what your next project will be? Well, I think like many writers, you never have to look far. There's <laughs> always something brewing in your mind. And as an antidote to, to writing Holocaust history, I've been working on another young adult story. And it still has elements of history, but fantastical, a fantastical story. That's um, And yet I still find things that I'm interested in slipping in. There are still things that, that, that need to be told. Um, in terms of the next history book, I'm very much still involved in pursuing further research around this topic. And since the book came out uh, in September, so it's only been out a few weeks, I've been contacted by so many people sharing their own family stories. And so I just know there's going to be something that hooks me. You know how it is when an idea really sticks in your brain, no matter how many work in progress you have piled up, and it will be the one that you keep coming back to. So I'm just waiting for that hook. 
and sometimes the uh, the idea has a way of chasing you down and and forcing itself upon you, doesn't it? Absolutely. And they're the best ones. And you have to pay attention to the ones that want to be told, not the ones you think you were telling. Yes. I love it. I love it. Well, the new book is available everywhere now. It's The Dressmakers of Auschwitz, the true story of the women who sewed to survive. This is a must have uh, for your to be read pile this fall. Pick it up today. We're going to put links to it in the show notes of this episode where you can grab it in Kindle edition or hardcover or audiobook. Uh, however you like to read, you can absolutely grab this book. It's available oh, in every format. Hank, I read the audiobook. I got to tell you. So you get to hear it from the author. I didn't realize you, that you narrate it. That's amazing. It, it was a really interesting experience. And I know that's going off at a tangent, but how different to listen to your own text and analyze it that way. A whole different topic. I'm sorry I interrupted oh, you there. No, 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 that's that that's amazing. I was gonna ask you how you um liked having your book translated to audio, but being that you did the the audio translation, that's amazing. That's even better. It was one of the hardest things I ever did. Uh, but also, yeah. like I say, it, you, it's a very intimate way of engaging with your text and you realize how the rhythms of your writing go and, and you wonder how it's coming across to people. What will be really interesting, Lucy, is to see how your next book, if you start paying attention to those things, you know, after having read it out loud for the audiobook, will that, um, you know, seep into, you know, the way you edit yourself? That that'll be really yeah. fun to chat about again I do I do listen to my I mean I read I do read my own work you know sort of that mumbly blah 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 when you're going through the paragraphs <laughs> and there is there is definitely some parts of the book where there's a there's a rhythm to it and there's a lyricism to it but I understand that some people write entirely for the audio market so that's such a skill in itself isn't it it is it is well, however, you if you like to read it yourself or have it read to you, you can do that. There's links in the show notes of this episode where you can grab it today. Lucy, um, if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, uh, where can they find you online? I um, I have a website. My name is it's LucyAdlington.com or just Google Lucy Adlington. And um, I'm also History Wardrobe. That's the name of my company, essentially um, costume history, clothes history. And so people can see all sorts of virtual events or in-person events or blogs and so on. And it's lovely to be in touch with people around the world. Absolutely. We'll put links uh, to all those places in the show notes as well. Lucy, this has been so much fun chatting. We're going to send everyone to pick up their copy of The Dressmakers of Auschwitz. And uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Hank, it's been really interesting. Thank you. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. On Walpurgis night, when the moon is high, hell's bells ring and witches must answer. They dapple their breasts with rendered fat of murdered babes, straddle their brooms and take to the sky as the devil wills to speed through dreamy midnight air to the summit of the Brockenberg, that haunted peak shrouded in swirling mists where a glen of gnarled limbs and wan moonlight awaits to host their debauches and blasphemies. Now to the brock and the witches ride. The stubble is gold and the corn is green. There shall the carnival sabbat be seen, and the devil shall come to preside. The accuser elopes from the bowels of hell, a sure-footed, goat-headed, many-horned beast with cloven hooves and a staff of bone. He perches upon the witch altar to brood in cerulean half-light, a winged silhouette with watchful red eyes. The witches gather and bow to their master. Upon his charred rump give the shameful kiss. Then imps beat the drum and a round dance begins. Lash yourselves into frenzy, hags. Pass the chalice of pure marrow broth. Whip the ground with your hair. Tread the sky with your feet. Dance with joined hands around Satan's cold fire. Then find out a nook of nettles and moss, and lay with the rough-skinned beast of your choosing, suckling some rancid teat of desire. But hist! 
The cock crows. Away, away. Gather your tatters and broomsticks and wits back to your huts, to your thresholds and hearths, and become once more, at the red break of day, the furtive adder in your neighbor's garden. The ghost host of the Salem Sorcery Tour, dazzling in his steampunk Victorian morning crepe, let the spell he'd woven trail through the twilight air like a hag across the moon, then chirped, isn't that silly? And bowed, sweeping the wet grass with his satin-ribboned top hat. The tour group gave a polite round of applause. Nobody believes that stuff today, but the Puritans sure did. They took witches very seriously. If they went down in the morning and bought eggs, and one was rotten, surely the devil had come in the night, gone boop, tee-hee-hee, then scampered off on his little hooves. And who's in league with the devil? Witches. We're taught that the Puritans were super nice and cute with little buckles on their hats, but it's not the case, folks. They were fanatics. Witch hunts don't happen in a healthy society. They hated kids. They hated women. They were crazy. And that craziness. He turned on the spot, casting a protective circle around the stone garden of the witch memorial. Got these people killed 